Well, good morning, Christ Chapel. Great to see you. Whatever venue you're worshiping in or if you're worshiping uh, abroad or at home, uh, please, everyone, open your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, if you're opening one of the blue Bibles at any of our venues, it's page 926. I would love for you to have a copy of the scriptures open as we'll be looking at some different things. We are going to read a a section uh, of the scriptures that we're going to study this morning. Also wanted to let you know, we've asked you to pray for uh, Israel and please continue uh, to do that. I wanted you to know a couple of things that we're doing uh, in order to respond. Uh, The elders on your behalf have sent a hundred thousand dollars to two particular organizations that can help with humanitarian aid, some medical aid, and evangelistic efforts over in Israel and uh, those uh, Middle Eastern areas right now. Uh, so wanted to let you know that. So thank you for your generosity. Again, because of your generosity, you allow us to move quickly and swiftly into these areas that need help financially. So thank you for doing so. I uh, also wanted to let you know that next Sunday evening at 5 o'clock, we are going to host the president of one of those organizations, uh, Tom Doyle, who's the president of Uncharted. Uh, He's been a partner with us for a long time with Christ Chapel. Uh, We're going to host him at the Fort Worth campus at five o'clock in the sanctuary, uh, and he's going to be giving us some real-time information about what's going on in Israel. He's also going to help us interpret some of that news, and we're going to have a prayer time for Israel. So wanted to let you uh, know that uh, we are praying for Israel and want to continue to uh, respond appropriately as God has called us. And those are two uh, certainly appropriate ways. Okay, now let me take you back in time, back to 1991, when REM released the song, Losing My Religion. How many of you remember that song? Man, what a classic song. It is a great song. Can you hear the mandolin? You know, right here? You know, I mean, it's, it is great. Great song. And what that song was really about was it's about this unrequited love. You, you know the phrase, losing my religion means basically uh, I'm losing my uh, sanity. I'm, I'm losing my, my civility. I, I, I'm getting so, so frustrated and so, so irritated. I, I'm just, I'm losing. I can't. I can't hold it all together. And so they wrote this song based on this unrequited love, this this person that uh, wanted another person to to love them, to to notice them, to to return their affection. And they're always wondering if they they even notice them, if they even know that they exist. And it goes back and forth. In fact, uh, Michael Stipe, the lead singer of uh, REM, he said this, uh, the song is about holding back about reaching forward, then pulling back again. But the thing that is most thrilling is you don't know if the person I'm reaching out for is aware of me or if they even know that I exist. Now, I don't particularly find that thrilling, you know. Uh, He finds that thrilling. Maybe it was thrilling writing a song about it because it's a very clever uh, song with with the lyrics. And that mandolin, man, that is just great. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that I think we can all relate to is that roller coaster of emotions. We've all at one time had someone else that we pined for their affection. We pined for their attention and we weren't even sure if they noticed us. We, we, we would kind of step forward and kind of lean into them and then we would think that maybe our, our um, affections or attention were spurned and so we would pull back. But then we would read into a situation and, and think, oh, maybe, maybe, they, maybe they were looking at me. Maybe they said that because they wanted me to hear that. And so we lean back in only to think that we've then been rejected. It's this roller coaster of emotion and we've all been there with another person at some time in our lives. But my question is this, have you ever thought that about God? Have you ever wondered, God, do you even know if I exist? Like, I, I, I want to know you and I want to know where I stand with you. But sometimes I don't know where I stand with you. 
I feel like I, I, I lean in, but I, I try to read the tea leaves of my, my circumstances in, in my life, but I just don't know how to interpret those. And sometimes it feels like you're for me, and sometimes it feels like you're against me. And I go back and forth on this roller coaster of emotions, and honestly, it makes me lose my religion. I, I, I lose my civility. I lose my sanity, and it just makes me want to completely pull back and become apathetic to everything in our lives. Uh, that's the context for the passage that we're going to be studying today in Acts chapter 17, where Paul is going to step into these people that are uncertain about where they stand with God because the God that you know, the God of the scriptures, is unknown to them. And he wants to step in and say, he does know you, he does see you, and he does want a relationship with you. And so let me give you some context of where we are. Again, we're in Acts chapter 17, and where we were last week, just to show you a map, we're going to be in Athens. Where we were, remember we went from Philippi, last week we were in Thessalonica and Berea, Two totally different responses to Paul reasoning with people in the synagogue. He leaves Berea, he goes to Athens, and he's waiting for Silas and Timothy. And so he goes to Athens, and Athens is a, a unique place. There was a university in Athens. Athens at the time was known as the intellectual capital of the world. They, they, they had all of the knowledge that the world could have at that time, which is very ironic that we're going to be talking about a God that they do not know. So at, it's, a, it's a university city, but they don't know about God. And that's the context that Paul enters into here in Acts chapter 17. So what I want to do is I want to read verses 16 and we're going to stop at 23 even though we're going to study uh, some of the rest of the passage there. So follow along with me. It says, now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? And others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Verse 19. And they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears and we wish to know therefore what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Verse 22, so Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. We're going to stop right there for today. May God bless uh, the reading of his word. May our hearts be open to hear from him. So Paul uh, is, enters into the city of Athens, and gosh, there are so many great words uh, here uh, that I want, we'll break down as we go, but that's why I just wanted to read the passage. It's a beautiful passage, but as he enters into Athens, it says that his spirit is provoked. Man, what an interesting word. It's this idea that his, uh, actually the word means sharp. Um, it, it's, it feels a, a sharpness. It, it, it's a... It's a disturbing emotion that he feels. He's troubled internally. He's troubled in his spirit. And the reason why he's troubled in his spirit is because he says, this city is full of idols. But I, I love what that word, that when it talks about full of idols, what it actually means is they are submerged under idols. They, they are drowning in idols. The, the, the idols are pushing, pressing them down. 
They, they are oppressing their lives. They're oppressing them from knowing the true, only true God, the one, only one who is worthy of their worship. And, and that, that disturbs him. That, that, makes him, that makes him feel something for them, a, a, a grief, a sharp pain, a, a, I have to act. He's compelled to do something about it. And so what he does is he goes first to reason in the synagogues. Now, if you were with us last week, you remember that that was Paul's custom. That word reason is dialogue. He would always go into the synagogue and dialogue. And we talked about how uh, last week and at the beginning of Acts chapter 17, that's the first time that Luke uses that term reason in the book of Acts for Paul's approach. Well, we find a second approach that Paul uses this week in this passage, and that is he, uh, he approaches the marketplace daily. We, ha- we haven't seen him do that yet, at least as, as uh, Luke has recorded in the book of Acts. And so he's going to go into the marketplace to reason with those in the marketplace of whomever would listen to them. And this is that, that kind of second approach that we're t- going to talk about as we talk about revealing the unknown God. Because he's going to go into the places where people work. He's going to go into the places where people live. And we'll talk a little bit more about the marketplace in just a second. But this is why we've encouraged you to go into the marketplace, to go into your jobs, into your neighborhoods, into your hobbies, into the school. Go, go reveal the unknown God. And the way that he's going to do that is he's going to start where they are. He's going to use, use things in and around them all to point to here is the God who wants to know you. And he wants you to know where you stand with him so that he can have a relationship with you. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk back through this so that you can see that approach. And I think you're going to see that ancient Athens is very similar to modern day America. Very similar. And I want to show you that as we break down this passage. And then I'll give you some applications at the end and hopes that all of us would lose our religion. So let's go back uh, at the beginning and show you that everyone worships something or someone rightly or wrongly. Everyone worships someone or something rightly or wrongly. Now when I say worship, I want to explain what worship means. And I put this at the top of your uh, sermon notes. When I talk about worship, what I mean is they are ascribing worth through various forms of expression. Uh, when he talked about the idols that were there in Athens, they uh, were, many of them were, were statues or figurines or something that, that was an image uh, uh, carved or molded of a, a god. Someone that they would, they would give their forms of worship, they would uh, feed, they would, they would try to give their expression, they would give their attention and affection in hopes that that figurine, that statue, that whatever that they're worshiping would there in turn give them or provide for them the things that they need. That that, that would protect them, that that would give them purpose, that would give them meaning, that would give them identity. And everyone worships someone or something rightly or wrongly. And he sees that they're worshiping these things that can never provide for them, that can never protect them, that aren't worthy of their worship. And that's why his spirit is provoked and goes into the marketplace to begin to to talk to these folks. And in verse 18, if you look back at it, it says, some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him that that's Paul and some said what does this babbler wish to say and others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection so he goes in he starts talking to two different groups of people in the marketplace and I want to break down those two two groups of people but remember I I want to I want to explain the marketplace quickly the marketplace is not just the grocery store when it's talking about this 
The marketplace in Athens was the, the city center for everything that happened. Yes, they would have traded goods, but they also would have traded ideas. They also would have traded philosophy. It would have been a place where you would have had uh, art, where you would have had drama, where everything happened in the marketplace in Athens. So, there's so that's why there are so many idols that are there, so many things that people are giving their worship, their attention, they're giving worth to. And so he goes in and he talks to two, it says two specific groups of people. There are the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, I want to tell you about those two groups of people. The Epicureans, their philosophy on life was basically do whatever pleases you. Do whatever makes you happy. They sought pleasure, happiness, and tranquility. I can get on board with that. I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I don't blame them. And the way that they tried to pursue those things was through experience. That was, that was the way that they found truth was through, through their own personal experience. Their motto, the Epicurean motto for life was enjoy life. Now, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we're gone. That, that, was, that was their philosophy. That was the Epicurean philosophy. Does that sound like America? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yes. Tr truth is through experience, through many people's eyes. It's, it's, not, it's not objective truth. It, it's just through whatever I experience, whatever makes me happy, whatever pleases me, I'm going to enjoy my life. That is, that is America. We, we are modern-day Epicureans today, so, so many of us. Then there's another uh, group of people here, and those are the Stoics. Now, the Stoics were Stoic, okay? So they sought truth through reason. They were, they were actually pantheistic. They, they believed God was in everything, and their role was through reason and understanding to just fit in with the natural order of, of life. Uh, their motto was endure life. So if the Epicureans was enjoy life, the Stoics was in, endure life, but it was through, it was through reason. It was, it was through the mind, and we have many modern-day Stoics in our world today. That, that say, I, I just need to fit in with the universe. The universe is telling me this. The, the, I, I reason through science, through philosophy, through whatever. This is, this is the universe and how I need to fit in to it. And so there, we, have, we have modern day Epicureans and modern day Stoics uh, today. And, um, and that's why I say that everyone worships someone or something rightly or wrongly because everyone is giving their time and affection to someone or something. In order to get pleasure, in order to get a provision, in, in order to get protection, in order to find a purpose or a meaning in life, that, those some things could be a job. Uh, the, the job gives me an identity. The job or the career gives me financial security, protection. It gives me purpose. It gives me pleasure, what, whatever that may be. There, there are plenty of some things out there that people worship wrongly because they're never going to give what you give what you give back to that. But then people worship things or people too. I, I break it down into two categories of people, of, of worshipers, of people. There are Swifties and there are selfies, okay? Actually, there's three. There's Swifties, Kelseys, and selfies um, now that, that she's dating Jason Kelsey or Travis Kelsey. Um, so th there are people that people worship, and they say, I, I'm going to give my attention, I'm going to give my affection to this person, and, and they in turn will provide protection for me. Man, there are false messiahs running around out there who may not even claim to be messiahs, but whom people worship as those that will give them purpose, meaning, identity, provision, protection in their life. And sometimes that's just ourselves. It's just, I want to please me. I'm going to do what I want to do. We follow that Epicurean style. 
And so those are the people that Paul is talking to. Again, very relatable to, to modern day America. But what's interesting to me is they say, what is this babbler saying? If you look at that term babbler, um, the term actually means seed picker. Seed picker. The picture is a bird. A, a bird who goes along and picks this seed and picks that seed and they just pick what they want. And so what these Stoics and, and Epicureans are saying is Paul seems like a seed picker. Like he's just picking this idea and this idea and this idea. Why are they thinking that? I think they're calling him a babbler or a seed picker because there are elements of truth to the Epicurean philosophy and there are, are shreds of truth in the Stoic philosophies as well that Paul's going, yeah, you've got hints of it, but let me put it all together for you in the truth of who Jesus is and the resurrection. They're sensing, that sounds a little bit like this and a little bit like that. And he's starting where they are and he brings it back into who Jesus is. And we've got to keep that in mind. As we talk about revealing the unknown God to those around us in our own backyard, we've got to start where they are because there are elements of truth, things that they are, are wanting, things that they are wishing that are not necessarily bad things but will only find their fulfillment in Jesus. And that's what Paul is preaching and teaching in the marketplace. And what he wants to show them is that the one true God wants everyone to find and worship him. He, he's trying to reveal this to them, that the one true God wants everyone to find and worship him. So he preaches uh, to the, the Epicureans and the Stoics. He's talking day in and day out in the marketplace to these folks. And they end up taking him to the, uh, the Areopagus. Now, I want to show you what the Areopagus looks like. And, and this, I labeled it this way. This is labeled this way because I want you to see that th there's so much that is going on there in the center of Athens. Because you can see the theater down at the bottom. Uh, the Parthenon, obviously where the uh, Greek gods would have been worshipped. And then there's the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus, it means the, the hill of Ares, which was the Greek god of war. You might have also heard it called Mars Hill because uh, Mars was uh, the Roman god of war. And so, ironically, they take him to a place to do battle, that, that's where they take him to the Areopagus. Now the Areopagus was this stone, you can see where the people are standing, kind of this stone outcropping where a judicial and legislative council would meet to talk about things going on in the city. But they would also judge different philosophies so that these foreign philosophies, they were tolerant of them as long as they didn't upset the virtue of the city. They, they're okay. They'll take anything except for something that's going to upset the apple cart. And so that's why they're, they bring him to the Areopagus and say, hey, explain this to this judicial council. Because if they don't like what you're saying, you can't preach that here. So ironic because everything else could be taught there. Everything else was, was permissible. So they take him to the Areopagus and here's what he says in verses 22 and 23. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. You need to hear how gracious that statement is. It's very gracious, very respectable. We talked about this back in, in, reason, in when we talked last week about reasoning. Very gracious, very kind, starting where they are. I see that you are very religious. Verse 23. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Gosh, I love these verses. Absolutely love this. So, Paul goes in and he says, I see that you are religious. That, uh, the word religious can, can mean devout. I mean, it can mean religious, but it can also mean, I can see that you're a very devoted or de devout people. You're very devoted to objects of worship. Another way that it could, could be uh, 
translated is you're very superstitious. You're very superstitious. Not like Michael Scott, who's only a little stitious. Um, for those of you office fans out there. Um, I'm not superstitious. I'm just a little stitious. Um, so they're superstitious people. And that explains, I think, why they have an altar to an unknown God. Because there, there were many gods that were in Athens. In fact, one uh, historian said it was easier to find, in, in Athens, it was easier to find a God rather than a man. It, there are so many gods that are available there. And they go, we don't want to miss out and offend any God that we haven't included. So let's create this altar to an unknown God. Just to make sure that we've checked the box. <laughs> just to make sure that we're not leaving anybody out. That we're all inclusive of everything. They, they were that superstitious. And so they create this altar to an unknown God. Now that unknown means unknown, but it's actually where we get our word agnostic. That there, there is no God. A God who is unknown, forgotten, or forsaken. So it's this forgotten God. I mean, if, if, it's a, if it's an unknown God that you just set up an altar in order to check the box, it's probably not a whole lot you're going to do with it. You're going to put him on the back shelf. Forgotten and forsaken. Because he's unknown. But he's not unknowable. And what Paul does here in verses 24 to 28, he goes through and he begins to tell them about the one true God. This God that you worship is unknown. I reveal to you. And the way that he reveals him is he begins to contrast their Greek gods that they were worshiping, these Greek and Roman gods. And they was contrasting them with the one true real God the only one worthy of their worship. And he goes back and forth and contrasts them because Greek and Roman gods, they were really just uh, personifications of human characteristics and, and natural phenomenons, natural characters, the god of the sea, Poseidon, you know, I, like it's just this, we don't know how to describe this, so we're gonna give it a name and call it a god. And he's gonna contrast those impersonal forces that really didn't want to interact in human affairs. It, it, he, was, he was basically stepping into these fatalistic mindsets and saying, this God that you said is unknown is knowable. And the way that he contrasts them, I'm just going to give you some quick ones. He says that the, the, the Greek and Roman gods were impersonal, but the true God is personal. The, the, their gods wanted to be and needed to be served or appeased, but the true God that he reveals actually serves us totally, totally different. He says that their gods can be contained in temples, but the true God cannot be contained. Their gods were distant and uninvolved, but the true God is very involved in our lives, so involved that he's determined the times, the circumstances, and the allotments all in a way so that people would turn to him. He is that involved where he's, where he's trying to get your attention at all of those people's attentions. He contrasts them with their gods that they worship today. And I, I love how he does that. Again, he's starting where they are, but then showing them how their worship of their gods ends up leading to a dead end. It, 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 it's all going to end, and it's all futile. You should know the one true God that is completely different than everything you've, uh, uh, that you've worshipped. They are distant. He is personal. They're uninvolved. He's very involved. He's, he wants you to know him. And he set it up that way. And I love how we think about that today. Even how um, there are so many times where we worship God as an unknown God. Where we don't treat him as personal and involved and relatable, but we treat him as forgotten and forsaken, impersonal. He's on the back burner. We'll check the box. We'll, we'll, we'll just, we don't, we don't want to offend him, but we also don't want to relate to him. We don't want him too involved in our lives, and so we put him back there. 
And what he wants to do is put him back in the spotlight. Put him in the spotlight and say, this is the God who wants to be known. And he proves that he wants to be known because the one true God has made himself known in his son, Jesus. He's made himself known in his son, Jesus. See, Paul not only reveals that the unknown God is personal, but that he came personally in the form of his son, Jesus, to demonstrate his love unlike anything that they had ever known. If you look back at verses 29 to 31, it says, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold, silver, or stone. That gives you a clue into what their idols were like. An image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now, today, he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And, and of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And his name is Jesus. Thank you. Amen. His name is Jesus. This is the one. This is the one that you have been looking for. This is the one that you had an inkling that maybe this was possible. Maybe this was true. Maybe there is someone who is sovereign over the seas. Maybe there is someone who is involved in my life. Yes, there is, and his name is Jesus. That's what he is revealing. But he's unlike anything that you have formed. He's not like the silver stone or gold You see, what's so interesting to me is they had set up this altar to the unknown God like insurance. Like, man, I've got this insurance policy back here, and if the unknown God ever shows up, I can go, oh, no, look, insurance policy right here. See, I I got it. I, I, I checked the box. And what Paul offers is not insurance but assurance. Assurance that the one true God, Jesus, you can be assured that you can have a relationship with him because he is risen from the dead. He is alive. He is involved in your lives and in your world. And he wants to give them that assurance because he's unlike these gods that we've set up with stone or silver or gold that we've formed in our own image, in our own creation, in our own imagination. He said he's not like that at all. Jesus is the creator, judge, and savior. And he's coming and he says those times of ignorance God is going to overlook. He's going to overlook that you've made an altar to an unknown God. Okay? But today... Now is the time to repent and to come to know him. Now is the time because he's not going to overlook that any longer. And we know about this. Peter talks about this in 2 Peter about how God is patient. He's not, he's not slow. He's patient. Why? So that everyone will come to the knowledge of his son. So that everyone will come to salvation. He wants people to come to know him. That's why he's patient that's why, he's, that's why he hasn't come back as judge yet, but he, that's what he is alluding to. So, because Jesus is the only one worthy of worship, as he revealed during that time in Athens, and he's still the only one worthy of our worship today, let me give you three very quick applications. The first one is this, lose the religion that will only take you away from the one true God. Lose the religion that will only take you away from the one true God. Paul says that Jesus cannot be contained, controlled, or conformed to our own imaginations. He is God, and he is conforming us into the image of his son. You see, that religion says, I can control God. That religion says, I can control how much affection and attention I get from God by how much I serve God, how much I do for God, by basing my relationship with God on works. Our relationship with Jesus Christ is based on his work on the cross. 
that he died for our sins and rose from the dead. And by placing your trust in him, you can be assured that you have a right relationship with God and will be resurrected to eternal life. That is the assurance that you can have, the peace that you can have to know where you stand with God. Not basing it on, did you check all the boxes? See, that's religion. He wants a relationship with you. So lose the religion that will only take you further away from the relationship with the one true God. Second, turn to the one true God who constantly seeks a relationship with you. Turn to the one true God who continuously seeks a relationship with you. And the reason why I say turn to is because it's that word that he uses there, repent. Repent, remember, repent means to, to change your mind and to turn the other direction toward Christ. Stop trusting in the religion. Stop trusting and checking all the boxes. Stop checking and I'm doing all the right things, God. I hope, you're, uh, I hope you're pleased with me. To the turn back to him, to the one who has paid the penalty for your sins, who, who everything is finished, it's all paid for, it's sufficient in Christ. Turn to him as your only means of salvation. And the reason why I say who co- continuously seeks a relationship with you is because it's, it's this picture that he's got here as he describes who Christ is. And he says he wants to be known by you. He's not far from each one of us. And you go, well, why doesn't he just show? He's right there. But you are running away. That's why I say turn. <laughs> he's not far He's right there, but each of us have gone astray. That's what Isaiah 53 tells us. Each of us have gone our own way. Our hearts are far from him, and he's asking us, if you'll just turn and look toward me, I'm right there. I'm right there. Just turn toward him. He always wants a relationship with you. And then finally, reveal the one who came to be known and who will come again. Reveal the one who came to be known and who will come again. You see, what Paul reveals is that now, when he says now is the time, now is, uh, today is the day that Jesus came as Savior. But the second time he comes, he will come as judge. And for those of you that have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who've placed your faith in him, That doesn't scare you personally. That doesn't bother you personally. And it shouldn't. Because you know that your sins have been judged when Jesus paid the penalty for your sins on the cross. But guys, if we have any sort of compassion for other people, we got to go, I got to tell them. These are are my friends. These are my loved ones. And Cody, I don't want to offend them. And we are talking about someone's eternity at stake. (laughs) Would it be worth a moment that might upset their apple cart for a second? That might reveal a God that wants to know them? That wants to relate to them as Savior and not see them as his judge? I mean, I think it's worth it. And that's what I go back to. Why was Paul's spirit provoked? It was because so many people were deceived. And he's going, oh my gosh. These folks do not have a good end. This story does not end for them well. It ends for Paul just fine. But he has the heart of Jesus that cares for other people, that wants to reveal this unknown God. So, I don't mean to put you in a corner. I don't mean to put you in the spotlight, but it's time to lose the religion. Consider this the hint of the century. Okay, I'm going to stop with the REM lyrics, okay? (laughs) Guys, start where they are. May our spirits be stirred, provoked, troubled, because the God that wants to know them they do not yet know. Let's reveal the unknown God. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for your goodness and kindness that you would overlook those times of ignorance in our lives. 
and you would say, but today is the day. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your perseverance. Thank you for your unconditional love. Thank you for your sovereignty over all creation, over all times. Thank you for leading us all to this point, this very moment, to reveal yourself to us, to call us to turn to you for salvation as the only hope that we have. Lord, provoke our spirits to not only turn to you, but to also reveal you. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.